Some of you expressed concern about the length of these videos. For your convenience, check out the table of contents on the right hand side. Feel free to start at the beginning and work your way through the video for some awesome in-depth insights. But if you see what you came for, or just want to see something over that you didn't catch the first time, please feel free. And as always guys, thanks for tuning in. Hey guys, it's Shaft of the Clinic Casting Crew. Welcome to another episode of Crash Course, where we learn to be awesome. Alright guys, today we're going to be covering a Zerg vs. Protoss. In particular, it's going to be a Roach Burrow Movement Max. I know a lot of players, especially Zerg and Protoss players, are going to be familiar with with Stefano's Roach Max. Roach Maxes have existed for quite some time, but they fell out of vogue for a little while. Now in today's meta, you have players going for um, really, really greedy expansions. Um, still Nexus first builds, FFEs, all that good stuff, but you also have Gateway first. This is a good solid build against all of them. I'm a little bit unsure about the Gateway first option, but I've seen it work time and time again. Um, but I have mixed feelings about that. I'm going to reserve judgment on it. I'm particularly recommending this for Nexus first or anti-fast expand plays. Um, but, you know, feel free to experiment. Don't lock yourself into one particular style. This is going to be represented by Clarity Gaming Bop. He's not the inventor of this style, but he is a wacky, wonky, just all-out crazy Zerg player. <coughs> So, you know, you can always recommend, or always expect some very awesome games from this guy. Now, I see no further reason to, uh, you know, delay this, so let's hop right on into this game here. Uh-oh, we got a little bit of a glitch. Okay, so now that we've got that fixed, this is going to be a game from Clarity Bop. He is an amazing Zerg player. He loves wonky, wacky styles. He's not the inventor of this style, but he's definitely one of the better players at just pulling off crazy shenanigans. So you're going to learn a lot in this game, but this is mostly going to be a build order, kind of how to execute it style. We're not going to cover too much about adapting to what you see or anything like that. Um, my one recommendation, you know, this is great against Forge Fast Expands or Nexus First Builds. Use a grain of salt with Gateway first. Either way, uh, this build does start out with a 14 pull. However, here at 13 supply, as he's building up the 200 minerals necessary, he goes ahead and sends this drone. As you can see, you know he's scouting around to make sure this isn't a proxy hat or a proxy gateway build or a you know gateway or a, um, cannon rush or anything crazy that the Protoss could throw out, he's playing super, super safe. Uh, just going right on into this, and then he's going to go and send that back home, and he'll take his 14 pull. After he gets the 14 pull, he's going to build a 15 hatch. We'll zoom right on over here. And again, you see a uh, pretty safe play. He's checking all around, make sure that there's no cannon rush going on. One recommendation, don't actually mine those minerals, they're better used. This doesn't represent a discount on a hatchery, it's not going to be 295 because you're holding a mineral patch, so you're better to just wait on that. Now once these are up, he is going to go for pretty fast. Um, the Zerglings out of here, he's going to get four, that's two sets total, mostly to defend the third and to hold map control. You see that there are a lot of... Uh, Zonaga Towers here, and a lot of good territory that you can control your lanes around. And uh, that is going to be something you will do. Also, you know, just good for defense in case there's anything going on. As soon as he's uh, certain this is going to be an FFE build, as you can see, you know, he's uh, not real sure just yet. He's just opening as he normally would. Um, in, in fact, you know, this opening segment isn't quite as important. Uh, you know, you can open up any way you normally would. It's more the mid-game convergence point that I would say is most important. Either way, though, he does see that this is a uh, FFE, and that's enough information on that. Now, he's continuing to search around here for any kind of cannon rush. Now that he's convinced that this is not a cannon rush, he's sending an overlord and a couple of links just to this third to make sure nothing goes down here, and, you know, here's the drone. Now, once the drone has laid that hatchery, by the way, that hatchery was in 23 supply, he immediately saves up money and will build a queen after that. It is possible to get the queen before the hatchery, but it delays the hatchery 10, 15 seconds, something around in there. 
Um, so it's much, much better to get the hatchery and then the queen. I say that again. Hatchery, then queen. You get the queen at 22 supply. That's going to bump you up to 24, at which point you build an overlord. And as you can see, these individual pairs of wings scouting around. He eliminates that probe. He was hunting for the probe. Found that, killed that. He's going to make sure there's no pylon. Allison Prime even goes so far as to say life sucks. But uh, yes, this hatchery is completely, completely safe. So now he's moving across the map to see what else is going on. And he will uh, patrol those at his opponent's front. So now we're in uh, part two of this. We've basically opened up as soon as the third base is laid down and the scouting begins. Um, you can kind of consider this a transition point. We're going from our rope opener into more of a map control phase of the game. Um, this phase of the game is actually going to be characterized a couple of different ways. As this hatchery uh, begins to complete, we will see a... Um, a third queen queued up. So far we have one queen here at the main, one here at the natural that just finished, and ultimately we'll have, um, you know, a third queen here at this third. Only there will be four queens total at this point in the game, because this queen right here is going to inject once, and then as soon as this third queen is uh, started at this base, you'll notice this becomes a creep slave. So this is kind of a point in the game where we have the Zergine Ferguson vying for map control. There's the inject and immediately is going to go ahead and move out to start the injecting, or I'm sorry, the creep slaving. And we're waiting on just enough resources now for another queen. Oh, actually he's going to get four lings first. Okay, these four lings in fact are going to be more lings to help keep map control. You can see these lings moving around. Um, in fact, one ling has actually already died. He's seen the zealot move out, and it is important enough to him that he queues up four more lings to deal with this zealot. As you can see, the queen already in production, 22 seconds has been in production. And that's basically going to take care of us for map control. All right. So at six minutes, um, we went a little bit past that, but it's okay. At six minutes, we uh, do take our first two gas. You'll see he plops down these two gas geysers right here. Um, this is also going to be a point in the game where you know he gets his fourth queen as his third finishes up as well. There we go. We have that started now. But mostly this is going to be characterized by taking gas staying safe and getting the possibility that you know if your opponent hits some kind of all-in super early gateway timing you'll be alive to survive it but mostly this is ramping up towards layer tech uh high-end units that sort of thing so we've got the fourth queen now started and take a look here at the positioning of the lings these lings are very critical um, for the Zerg, it's really how he knows whether he's going to die or not. Remember, this is a point in the game where it's very feasible that the Zerg could be attacked. In fact, we even have this Zealot going the long way around here. He's trying to avoid any Lings, any kind of Zelnaga Towers or anything like that. And he's just assuming that this third base is here, and that's going to be exactly where he beelines towards. You can see how Bop is shuffling his Lings around that first he's going to go towards the Zelnaga Tower, which he's going to miss. Oh, oops. That's not the V key, that's the B key. Anyways, uh, he's going to miss the, Zel uh, the Zealot moving out towards his third just by... Oh, he, he actually saw it, but it doesn't seem like he saw it, saw it. Anyways, he's going to get distracted here by this probe. He's sending all his links to the probe, but then he peels all but one off. The rest of these are going to be set to patrol here at the front of the Protoss Natural. This is very critical because this ling is pretty much a death sentence to this probe. These lings want to make sure another probe doesn't come out as some Protoss dedicated to their timing attacks will continue to try to send out probes, in fact even send zealots out to, de to destroy the uh, zerglings before sending out a probe. So these six lings are just enough to kill an entire zealot Hence, the why he built 
as many lings as he did. Eight lings, or seven lings in his case, is enough to peel one off and send six to fight. Um, he did lose one, but that's okay. He doesn't have to build an extra batch because he's still got one more than six. Two more than six or one more than six, it doesn't matter. As long as you have more than six, enough to peel one off for a probe and enough to take out a zealot. As you can see, he did start a Roach Warren. Um, that was about 12 seconds ago, as well as an Evolution Chamber. This is also part of the Taking Gas phase. <coughs> roach Warren going to help him stay alive. Um, and the Evolution Chamber going to help him late game. Um, in fact, one other thing I do want to note is that it was at 6.5 minutes, 6.35 in fact, that the probe left. Keep this timing in mind, as this is a very common timing for an opponent to try to send out basically any kind of probe for a proxy pylon if you didn't already have one on the map. So expect one on the map and then get ready to take one out of the natural. Finally, here at seven minutes, we're gonna have metabolic boost queued up. And once he does that, we'll be entering the next phase. Boom, there's metabolic boost. So because of all this harassment that is going on, our the potential for harassment, rather, from the Protoss. You know, we do have Bob being very, very careful about how he sends out um, his lings. Ultimately, though, this probe does manage to survive just long enough to lay down a proxy pylon. In fact, Bob sees that. However, Bob is about to have something a little bit bigger to deal with. Here at seven and a half minutes, this zealot finally does arrive. That means he has to choose to deal with this or take out the proxy pylon. In fact, he's going to choose to keep his drones fairly safe, micro those around, and ultimately target down the Zealot itself. The Zealot did manage to take out two workers, or it might have been even three. And ultimately, you know, this Zergling finally killed off the probe and is going to take out the pylon as well. But this is a very critical point in the game because if for any reason that pylon was not scouted, this game would look entirely different. Take a look at our structures count right now. We have one gateway, one Stargate, one Robo facility for Allison Prime. So while he's not gonna flood in, you know, some kind of rush timing attack, there's a couple of things this, that could have happened. If this is not scouted, he can send in two, maybe three zealots at a time from a very rapid, close distance. And this is gonna be very annoying for the third, but mostly Allison Prime wanted Bop to scout this because Bop doesn't know that this is a rush he, or, or whether this is a rush or not. Bop is only just now scouting in here with an overlord at the eight minute mark and seeing more gateways in production which of course, if this pylon were to finish, that's at least a four gate, which means a lot more units being warped in at this moment. He also isn't seeing that there's a robo facility. He doesn't see that a um, robotics bay is about to be started. He also has not seen the Stargate. So, he's really thinking this is a major rush happening to him, or at least that's what his opponent wants him to believe. All this being said, at this point in the game, he is going to hunker down and take complete control of the map so he sees any attacks coming, and he gets a small rudimentary amount of bases. This is critical. All right. So, finally, once... Um, once the zealot is dealt with, he does build a spore, he builds a spine. This is only at the third, but ultimately he's going to reinforce the natural and the main as well, especially with spores. As you can clearly see, his opponent is going to be pumping out some phoenixes. At this point in the game, Bob has to be particularly worried about phoenixes. So, what he's doing now is going ahead and getting plus one missile attack. This is going to help him all game, but it's also going to help against phoenixes. What he's also going to do is start uh, pumping it up to lair. This is again, you know, right here about 8, 8.15. Um, and 
ultimately, once you know the first spore crawler finishes and the spine crawlers, he's going to continue pumping up spore crawlers to the rest of his bases. Uh, yeah, here's the other one here in the natural. Ultimately, this is because he is scared of Stargate, and in today's meta, uh, phoenixes are very, 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 very popular. He has not actually seen anything that would show him phoenixes. In fact, he's seen a robo and a robo facility. So, why is he worried about phoenixes? I'm pretty sure everybody would ask. It's just what people are doing. And in fact, his opponent is doing that. Therefore, you need to be prepared for phoenixes. A spore in each base, if he builds any more than four, you know, you might need more than that. But four phoenixes is easily handled by three spore crawlers. One in the main, one in the natural, one in the third. This third chapter is also going to be about defense. Anywhere from about six and a half to about nine to ten minutes in a Zerg vs. Protoss game will be all about defense. This time, we're going to be more worried about any kind of ground-based army. Currently, we've dealt with phoenixes, we've dealt with possible proxy gateways, we've dealt with quite a few things, but this is more of a tentative phase of the game. We're starting a macro hatch, getting some extra gases, and even starting up, uh, this is currently six roaches, ultimately it's going to be eight roaches, but most importantly, we've got the macro hatch. And the Placing of the macro hatch is very important. It'll tell you a lot about the mindset of the Zerg player who's dropping that macro hatch. And here's a little bit about that. Perfect macro hatches, ideal macro hatches, actually take place at whatever base you think is going to be attacked. The third, the natural, etc. In this case, an ideal macro hatch would have been placed right here at the third. Though, if you feel like you may lose whatever base you're building your macro hatch at, if you think even the macro hatch won't be enough to keep you alive, a macro hatch in the main is not that much worse than a macro hatch at your third. It just takes longer for your reinforcements to actually arrive. So by Bob building this macro hatch in his main, it indicates to me that he's a little bit nervous about losing his third. He's not sure what his opponent's doing. So far, his opponent has revealed a high gateway count with the possibility to build Colossi. This is what's known as a death ball army. And it's quite frankly, very, very strong at taking out third bases. We also see plus two gas uh, being built here. These are going to be here at the third. He's building them at the third is a little bit of a uh, sneak, kind of a sneak attack. His main will continue to be unscouted. He actually just killed off an observer, so it will be a while before another observer does uh, show up. So his opponent cannot be sure if this is a four gas zerg or a six gas zerg, i.e. a roaching zerg or mutilisking zerg. This is going to make Allison Prime a little bit terrified. So it, it's a little nuanced thing that Bop does, but I like it. Either way, we got those roaches popping out here shortly. Here at the nine and a half minute mark, we do have Lair completing. We're going to have Burrow researched in just a moment. He's also getting the uh, fifth and sixth gas. Um, there's Burrow, there's Gleal Reconstitution, there's an extra Spore Crawler. We have a lot of things happening right here at once. Extra Roaches started now. Um, mostly what he's going to be doing is spending a large amount of his gas, keeping about 100 banked, but everything else is going to go to Roaches. At that point, he's just making drones with his in inject cycles. We've got a couple of Zealots showing up here in the natural. This uh, Warp Prism is going to be worth its weight, but the Roaches are going to show up to deal with that. He's going to try and take out a Spore Crawler. That works a little bit, but, you know, ultimately it's just a Spore Crawler. Phoenix are going to show up and do a little harassment. But there's still Queens, there's still Roaches. Some drones getting picked up, some Roaches getting picked up. Roach is not going to die to that. Queen may fall. Yeah, Queen actually did die. And then another Queen uh, going to get picked up here. Will he get a chance to use off in time? No. A little bit sloppy there by Bob. Actually may even lose another Queen. No. Yeah, he did lose that Queen. So really a little bit sloppy there by Bob. 
the phoenixes do finally penetrate the zerg main and it's an interesting response we see from bob he's immediately building those queens he has to build those queens he's throwing up some extra spore crawlers roach speed about to finish um so we'll see burrow movement queued up we've even got uh potentially a huge number of roaches that could come out here as if your opponent is building a lot of phoenixes that means he's not building a lot of ground army and we see six phoenixes are on the field just now um actually it may be reduced to five at this point but i believe there were six at one point either way a lot of roaches he's going to be moving out trying to get his creep spread out and also you know apply a little bit of pressure to his opponent he has to be worried about his home territory if there's this many roaches on the field we've got plus two ranged attack coming as well which is always great for Zergy mcferguson um one other thing he's been doing since the phoenix got into his base He's building three, four, five overlords at a time. There's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, Phoenix, they kill overlords like crazy. It's really hard to keep all your overlords safe against Phoenixes, so this helps out a little bit there. And also, roaches take a huge amount of supply. In fact, that's the most expensive thing about a roach max. Isn't the units themselves, it's the supply to build them. So, yeah, here at 71 workers, we finally have um, our Zergy McFerguson going to go straight into all that roach production. And here we have the roaches. And as you know, roach burrow movement plus two finish up, he'll start moving out. Right now, he's still in a fairly defensive posture trying to get creep spread out there overlords everywhere they need to be. He wants to make sure he's not too vulnerable to the phoenixes as well. All the while pumping out roach, 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 roach. And since everyone knows how to spam their RD, we'll just zoom through this a little bit. Do, 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 do. Look at those roaches plunging across the field. His opponent does have a third base and Colossi. Colossi, of course, very, very good against roaches, but only when there's enough units that in front of the Colossi to buffer for them, with the possibility to do roach burrow movement and just burrow right underneath those Colossi and snipe them out. With enough micro and finesse, you can take out huge numbers of Colossi very, very quickly. In fact, he's even hugged the gateway units, and that's going to mean even the units buffering for the Colossi falling quickly. Now with only stalkers, pretty much four or five stalkers, and then a mortal here to deal with the roaches, the Colossi are being dashed against the wall even further. And here we go, here we go, here we go. Another Colossi getting sniped off there, and he's not going to try and fight uphill. He's just going to bait forward, um, or downward in this case, and force the Colossi to move forward, and then go back, get a wave of attacks off on the Colossi and then run away again to make him completely obsolete. See how this uh, Colossi keeps getting forced to move forward? Well, there's not enough roaches here to completely take that Colossi out, so he's not going to go snipe it, but it's the same tactic over and over and over again. Behind all of this, here in just a couple of moments, he will take a fourth base, uh, but at this point he's just continuing to pump out units. Uh, plus two has finished as well, and there's the other base, so... Behind this, he does have a game plan, expand, make a lot of bases. He has not managed to actually kill any uh, tech structures or any bases here, but he's taken out a lot of tech, and any kind of non-zero amount of damage with a build like this is exactly what you're aiming for. You can see him getting underneath the force fields with his burr movement, and that's really what this kind of gameplay is, uh, trying to snipe out. In fact, he's baiting that Colossi forward. He may be able to snipe that off. Nope, Colossi gets back in just the nick of time, but he's going to be able to target down the Robo facility and some of these pylons actually he's focusing on the gateway units. Having a hard decision, hard time deciding rather, which units he's going to want to target. Oh, there we go, a mole goes down very decisively. Other than that, he's just focusing on the gateway units using Burrow uh, regen to help him get in a better position against the Stalkers. 
And here we go, more Roche reinforcements coming in now. As you can see, his timing attack is not ultimately going to kill his opponent outright. It's going to be the damage he does to structures and hitting in multiple locations that make this a particularly viable option. He's also floating a huge bank, so you can see his macro slipping just a little bit. But that's okay, you have the opportunity to play it better. And here it goes. Even uh, even now, Allison Prime, well, Allison Prime is a very talented Code A level uh, Korean player. I mean, just quite honestly, amazing, phenomenal player. But Bop continuing to come in here and take out key units and structures, slowly whittling away the uh, Protoss army. In fact, Protoss armies as gateway armies are just not that good. So if you're able to take out high value, high gas, you count high tech units, for instance, Immortals, Colossi, Century, you should be able to uh, pretty much eliminate any kind of gateway composition you want afterwards on nothing but road reinforcements. In fact, as you can see, he's continuing to assault the Robo uh, units, and this is no exception, another Colossi, or another Immortal rather exploding all over Roach's faces. And this is uh, actually looking really, really good for Zerg now. He's about 70 supply ahead of his opponent. He's got a 12 worker lead and uh, 70 army, or 70 army, rather, um, advantage. So yeah, this is just pulling worlds and worlds ahead of him. As his units go down, you can see Allison Prime was defeated. Alrighty guys, so just to recap this with you, um, the beginning part of the game is just establishing map control. That's basically any Zerg vs Protoss, you want to keep map control so you know is your, if your opponent's moving out with a high gateway account. From that point on, you know, he went into an anti-Phoenix style because every Protoss does Phoenix for whatever reason. Spore crawlers try and just continue with the map control. At 11 minutes, he finally did manage to allow his opponent to get into his base, unfortunately. But even losing a lot of queens, even losing uh, some drones to that attack, he was able to switch it into an offensive build and take advantage of the fact that his opponent went Phoenix into Robo Bay into a Col uh, Colossi. Just so many different units. He, Bop was able to focus on that aspect, see that so many different texts were being researched and conclude from that scouting that his opponent had to, had to, had to have a low gateway count. As such, boom, mass roaches with burrow movement speed. And that's all she wrote, guys. If you like this broadcast, please check us out on Twitter. Uh, my Twitter is the only shaft. You can check out Bob's Twitter as well. That is just Clarity Bop, no kind of spacing. His team, Clarity Gaming, is Clarity underscore gaming on Twitter. And as always, please subscribe, guys. It makes a huge difference. Hit plus one on YouTube. Share it with your friends. Every click counts. And as always, don't forget to be awesome. This is Shaft signing out. Bye-bye. 신화의 선수가 되는 거고요. 그렇죠. 멀티에 방해도 받지 않으면서 안전하게 해주고 있는 모습인데 에, 맹동축의 스피드업이 되기 전에 즉 전방 매서만 싸워야 되고 전방만 좀 제거하고 빠지면 되겠습니다.